I could not escape was how the best defense, the most powerful defense of the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ is actually the Quran. There is no better defense of the legacy of the Sunnah than the Book of Allah itself. In other words, there's no way somebody can actually say that they believe in the Quran and they don't believe in the Sunnah. The only way they can really say that is if they don't study the Quran. I think my mic got cut off, but the, I'll say it again. The only way you can really say that is if you don't study the Quran itself. Or if you don't take each of its words seriously. So I wanted to give you an example of that. Uh, just of that. Of um, how the Quran protects the integrity of the Sunnah of the Prophet. And how it is actually... It's really the way to view the Sunnah is that it's actually the, the Quran brought to life. That's what it is. It's the Quran from the words brought into the life of a human being. Because the Sunnah is not just the words of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it's actually his actions as well. One really exciting project that um, hopefully it comes to fruition, I talked to Sheikh Abu Bakr from Australia about that. It's a, just a phenomenal project that he's working on, inshallah it's a Bayina project soon, uh, is that he wants to go through the entire corpus of Sunnah and tie every hadith to an ayah of the Quran. Just to illustrate how these two things are inseparable. They're just inseparable. But anyway, today's uh, discussion, I wanted to make it about uh, legislation. Because one of those philosophical arguments is, Allah has the right to give laws. But the Prophet ﷺ is just Allah's slave. He has no right to decide laws or judge. It. Law can only come from Allah. And therefore, the sunnah is secondary. Quran is primary. That sounds like a powerful argument at face value. Even if, as you hear it, you're disturbed by it, I'm sure. But it sounds like a pretty rational, powerful argument. I want to just explore one place in the Quran where Allah responds to the subject. This happens in Surah An-Nisa. And Allah Azza wa says, Bala, on the contrary, wa rabbika, I swear by your master. Now these ayat, these are I believe ayat 66 and 67. Let me open them up in my Mus'haf too. Um, ayat 66 and 67. And they are intricately tied to each other. Um, in one ayah, in the first of these two ayat, uh, hold on a second, let me find the ayah number exactly. Yeah, no. Fala wa rabbika is 65, and then the next one is 66. Those two ayat, 65 and 66. Okay. So here, one of the rare occasions in the Quran, in ayah number 65 of Surah An Nisa, where Allah decides to swear by Himself. Allah swears by time, Allah swears by the sky, Allah swears by, you know, the, you know, uh, the, the sun, wa shamsi wa duhaha, Allah swears by the morning, right? But the, by the placement of the stars, fala uqsimu bi mawaqi'in nujum. And those are some magnificent creations of Allah, but this place is one of the more unique places in the Quran where Allah decides to make this point. None of those creations are magnificent enough to give you an idea of the value, the power of what is being said. So he says, وَرَبِّكَ I swear by your Rabb. But I, I, before I go on, one just quick precursor about the, the purpose of taking an oath. Like he says, I swear by your Rabb. What is the purpose for which an oath is taken, especially in the Quran? There are several reasons. I've talked about them in several lectures. I'll be very quick today about this. Uh, the, the first reason is that you're angry. Uh, you stop. Stop it. Stop. I swear you better stop it. So when you say I swear, it can be an expression of what? Anger. Another purpose of the oath uh, to swear is actually to get your attention, which is common in Arabic culture. It's not so much in other cultures, but in Arabic culture, in old Arabic culture, when you swore, you're trying to get people's attention. Okay? So when you swear, like, and you usually swear by something that will get people's attention. So they'll say, well, sabah, I swear by next morning. So everybody's thinking, oh my God, something bad's happening tomorrow morning. I better go listen. They try to get the attention. You know, the way we do try to get attention is, excuse me, please, could you please listen? There's an important announcement. Please, please, kindly, you know. But their way of getting attention was just to call it out, take an oath. Okay. Another easy way to think about an oath is when you take an oath when you're not being believed. Why are you late? Oh, it was a lot of traffic. Mm-hmm, traffic. I swear, I swear to Allah, it was traffic. 
So you swear because you're not being believed. Somebody listening to you is not sure about the truth of what you're saying. But then the Qur'an adds another dimension. All of these are true, but the Qur'an adds another dimension to the oaths that doesn't exist elsewhere. And the Qur'an adds the dimension that it actually, it takes two parts. It takes the thing you're swearing by and the subject. Right, for example, Allah swears by time. That's the thing that He swore by, time. And then the subject was that human beings are in loss, right? So there's the object, the thing, and the subject. What Allah does in the Qur'an is He takes the object, the thing that you're swearing by, and He makes it a proof of the subject. So for example, وَالْعَصْرِ إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ لَفِي خُسْرِ I swear by time, human, human beings are in loss. What's the biggest proof that human beings are in loss? They're running out of time. You can gain a lot of money, you can't gain time. You can gain strength, you can't gain time. You can never own it either. You can own property, you can own things, you can own clothes, you can own money. You can't own even one minute. You can't own it. It's not up to you. So the ultimate proof of the loss of a human being is what? Time. So the, the thing he swears by becomes proof of what's coming. So coming to this ayah, it is as though nothing in existence is strong enough proof for what he's about to say that the only thing that can truly prove what he's about to say is himself. He uses himself as proof for what he's about to say. When he says, Fala, then no, wa rabbika, I swear by your Rabb. By the way, the ka in Rabbika, your master, the ka from Anta, you did that today, right? Goes back to the Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So actually, this oath is a direct conversation with who? The Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We're indirect audience. The direct audience of this ayah is the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Fala wa rabbika. Okay. Now the Messenger is about to be told something that is so powerful, and the evidence of it and the witness of it is Allah Himself. Allah Himself testifies to what He's about to say. What is it that He's going to say? First thing He says is, La yu'minuna. They don't believe. The big truth that He was going to give to the Prophet is what? They don't believe. Wow. Uh, I don't want to be part of them. If Allah in the Quran somewhere said they don't believe, that's bad enough. When he swears by himself, goes out of his way. Not even to swear by something else, by himself, making himself the ultimate witness and proof. And then says they don't believe, he must be talking about a group of people who have no shred of iman whatsoever, as far as he's concerned. Like this is the strongest statement of saying someone doesn't have iman, I would argue in the entire Quran. There's no stronger way of saying somebody doesn't have iman. By the time you read this much, and I read this much, we're supposed to get really worried. Because he doesn't say who they are. He just says they don't believe. I don't know who they are. I better find out. Because these are people in some serious, serious trouble. He says, Hatta yuhakkimuka. Until, they don't believe, until they make you the judge. They make you the judge. They make you the hakim. Hakkama, to make someone a hakim. To make someone the decision maker. Hukum also doesn't just mean, hukum is different from qada. Qada actually means a verdict. Like a qadi is a judge, and he does qada. So he does a verdict. Hukum is actually a, a verdict and a judgment made with wisdom. Because hukum shares the same root with what word? Hikmah. So when you do hukum, you're actually passing a verdict that is full of what? Wisdom. Okay. Until they make you, I'll put it in that sense then, until they make you, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the wise decision maker. Because in, in the word yuhakkimuka, the messenger alayhi salatu wa sallam has already been declared full of wisdom. Not only the decision maker, but also full of wisdom. Now, I told you somebody argues that the decisions should be made not by the messenger, they should be made by Allah. They should be made by the Qur'an. And the Qur'an should be the final decider. The Qur'an is saying not they don't have any iman until they make the Qur'an the decision maker. They don't have any iman until they take the revelation and make it the decision maker. 
Allah is saying they have no shred of iman and he swears by himself until they make you, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, you the decision maker. How personal is that? He tells him directly, until you are taken as the judge of everything that they do, they have no shred of iman. I want you to, before we go on with this ayah, I want you to think about this, this very important concept. To us, the Qur'an is a book. And then the sunnah is a bunch of books. You know, when people think of sunnah, they think of, for example, books of hadith, among other things. Bukhari, Muslim, you know, Tirmidhi, etc, 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 yeah? So this is Qur'an and this is what? Sunnah. Two, two separate departments in the library. Qur'an, Sunnah. Now think about the Sahaba. Abu Bakr is sitting there. When he thinks of Qur'an, what does he think of? He doesn't think of a book. There is no book there. Whose voice plays in his head when he thinks of Qur'an? The Prophet of Allah, Sallallahu And when he thinks of Sunnah, what does he think of? For the Sahabi, the Qur'an and the Sunnah come out of the same mouth. The Qur'an and the Sunnah are the same person to him. You see, Al-Qur'an yamshi, like the Sahabiya describes, the mother of the believer describes, Qur'an walking around. Kana khuluquhu al-Qur'an, his character was Qur'an itself. If you want to see Qur'an come to life, you see the Prophet Wasallam. To him, to, uh, to them, they were not two different sections of a library. They were one person, completely inseparable. Now to us, we think of this as one source and that as another source. We separated those two things. So he says, Hatta yuhakkimuka until they make you the decision maker. Fima shajara baynahum. What incredible language. He says, until they make you the decision maker in whatever, whatever sprouts between them. Shajara, you know what the word shajara means, right? It's tree. Shajara as a verb means something that comes out of the ground. Now the thing is, there are things that are still in the ground and there are things that will later on come out of the ground, yes? In this ayah, Allah is saying that whatever has already come out of the ground, whatever issues have already been raised, and whatever issues will be raised in the future. In all of them, who should be the one deciding? The Messenger of Allah 